fire safety. Um, and I believe we're being filmed, is that correct? Yes. Are we being filmed live? Yes. Well, you're being filmed no. you're not being broadcast. We're not being broadcast. No, you'll be put up on the North Street Association YouTube site. Okay. Um, first item of business is public comment, if anybody has any. I don't see members of the public, so we will move on from public comment. I would also like to introduce, and I, I overlooked this last time, our newest member, and that's partially because I'm our new chairperson. I know you introduced yourself last time, but if you could do so again, and, you're, and where you're coming from, who, whose appointment why am I here? Why are you here? Yes, okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Ann Brooks, and I'm an eight-month appointee to the uh, planning board. And um, I'm here because I'm here because I'm here because I'm here, I guess. <laughs> right, yeah, I think you're the planning board representative. That's right. <laughs> well, welcome. That's right. Sorry. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you. <laughs> so the uh, first item of business is the, to amend ordinance 350-350A about height limits in office industrial and general industrial and central business district. And I believe we have a member of the planning board. So, Carolyn. Yes. I'm officially the planning board. So the first item of business is to amend ordinance 350-350A about height limits change. I think it's, it's increasing the height limits in Central Business District, which um, is currently at 65 feet, to 70 feet. And it really, it, it's, it's um, and, and actually in the office industrial and general industrial by five feet as well, although the, it starts at 40 and goes to 45. The whole idea with it, and I think, I mean, the rationale is, is listed as part of the ordinance, but um, the extra <coughs> five feet, based on what we know from builders, designers, developers, that um, could, that extra five feet could actually mean the difference between a story or not building a story. So instead of sort of having an arbitrary 65 foot height limit, we may be, um, you know, um, inadvertently eliminating an option for going just, you know, a few more feet and getting a whole other story of economic development, essentially, out of a project. And the same is true in the industrial zone. We don't know that we would get, uh, particularly in the industrial district, we mostly see one-story buildings. But if someone were to build a multi-story office building, like down at Atwood Drive, um, or you know, we've had multi-story now um, more recently um, office buildings, and so that little extra bit of square footage could potentially help bump it up, and then you reduce your footprint and impact on the site. So that's what it's all about. The one thing I wanted to add, I have a, um, a revision that I wanted to glom on a couple of other minor text changes to the office industrial um, section that I thought could go. This wasn't in the originally introduced um, ordinance, but um, the highlighted yellow at the bottom are just some text cleanup items in the ordinance. We were um, told by a city solicitor that uh, we had to actually do this by ordinance instead of by administrative change. And it's when we um, amended this, it used to be special industrial district, we changed it to office industrial, and there are a few um, leftover references to SI. But we actually had to do it as an ordinance instead of just right. going through and doing it. So that's what the gold is on the bottom Can of the page. Can I ask you a general question? Do we have these coming up for other ordinances as well that are just um, clerical yeah. changes that you'll be passing out yeah. for each one? Well, no, not for each one. We just have, I, um, there were some, after the city solicitor reviewed a couple of other ones, there's, I think there are two other ones that have minor changes. Okay. Questions? Yeah. I, actually, I very much agree with the 65 to 70 feet. That was a question I had for Wayne a year ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, my next question is, an extra floor is more space how about parking? Um, well, I mean, we find this now with the center of Florence with the Clinicism programs. I mean, we're going through all kinds of uh, turmoil with parking there. Um, and it started off to be a floor, and it was two floors and three, and now it's four, four floors, and now we've got parking all over the place. 
Well, it depends on the district. In downtown Florence, we have a parking requirement for every additional square footage that you add. So if you can't meet the parking requirements in downtown Florence, then you couldn't do that extra square footage. On the other hand, it could be that you're um, making the building footprint smaller and going up, so the square footage could ultimately be the same if you're building new construction. So it all depends on the situation. In central business, we have eliminated the parking requirements. Um, so even if you're building a three-story building, you don't have to provide parking because of the public parking facilities that we have on street and in lots. And actually, we eliminated in the general industrial district, we eliminated the parking requirements as well because the general industrial districts are pretty isolated. And um, for the most part, the industrial users often, um, we were finding that they were asking for special permits to reduce parking from the zoning requirements. And so we thought, well, if they know how much parking they need, why should we have an arbitrary number for parking? So, you know, I think it's just one of those things that would work itself out in both of those districts. But it's not the same across the city. We have parking requirements based on square footage. Okay, thank you. Other questions? How, uh, how tall is the uh, Apple Drive project? Um, I is think it, it's it two stories. No, no, no. no. Why 545 versus 50? Um, well, we don't think that, um, I guess. Uh, I mean, isn't it the same issue? Like right? getting five extra feet? Well, we did talk that through with builders, and so when you're at that level, you know, it might be a four-story, but we don't anticipate there being anything bigger than that. I mean, there might be, but there hasn't been demand for five- and six-story buildings, and we haven't talked about going significantly higher in the industrial districts. I mean, downtown is our most intense development area, so that's where we, and we have some, we have one building at 65 feet already, um, but in the industrial districts, there are, um, further out from the center, and we haven't really um, experienced the demand for, you know, five and six-story buildings. Okay. There's no other questions. Uh, I think what you'd like is a recommendation out of this committee, is that? Right, and with the additional language with that, the additional. yeah. So let's move on here. The, now we're on to, uh, to amend 350-344. So uh, no, no modifications. Let me, no let me just state the general thing, because since we're on camera, this is to rezone parcel, parcels on East Hampton Road from BP to SR to GI to help fulfill the business park provision. And then maybe you can you know, phrase, explain that if anyone's going to watch this. Sure. So there's, uh, there are um, three parcels, so this is what we refer to as a map change. Um, we're changing the underlying district. And um, in the one case, the parcel that is um, uh, currently zoned suburban residential is a residential zoning, but the old um, nursing home, which then was converted to a dog daycare kennel thing on East Hampton Road, is, is zoned suburban residential, but um, was, uh, has, has never been a residential use. And, um, at, and, and so um, given the limitations for the reuse of that building in a residential fashion, it made sense to sort of reevaluate the zoning for that parcel at the same time that we were looking at rezoning the next a budding parcel, which is a bigger piece of land, um, out of business park and to in general, general industrial. The reason um, that and business park zoning was established, um, I don't know, 12, maybe 12, 15 years ago, as um, a zoning um, that envisioned 
the development of all of those parcels, there were several large, and I forget what the acreage is, maybe 15 acres of land or more um, along East Hampton Road as a package so that uh, the, uh, the vision was that even though there were multiple property owners at some time, it, would, it could be developed as um, sort of a unified unit, almost like the industrial park where you have one main entryway and you have multiple parcels off of that drive. Um, because of land constraints, different, different land ownerships, um, the fact that there's no sewer service there, it's um, taken a very long time to um, sort of even, um, for that property to come to fruition or those multiple parcels to come to fruition. We've also since then done a lot of um, wetlands analysis and the, um, the land is not, there's a, a significant portion of all of those parcels when looked at combined are not developable at all. So the idea really is to, and because business park zoning is set up to um, be, um, have multiple parties talk to each other and come together with a plan, general industrial zone, on the other hand, is a really sort of case-by-case -case basis. So one, it, so one property owner can come forward and, and propose a, a project on the site. So the idea is to make it a little bit easier on the develop, on the upland and high and dry portions of the property, have the rezoned for general industrial, um, and also the other parcel that is not even a residential use, bring that um, to a general industrial zone, which is consistent with the zoning across East Hampton Road. Just before you get to Allen's Street or, or do so through recycling, there's a lot on the on the on the same side. Just before you get to it, it had a for sale sign on it. It had a Murphy Real Estate sign on it for years, for a long time. Is that one of those sites that's not developable? Is that? Well, you're, so you're, it's actually on the other side of East Hampton Road. Yeah. Is what I'm hearing. Um, I. It, could be that um, there are wetlands. There are a lot of wetlands on that side of the road. All around too. it, yeah. Right, and even so, where the um, even that site, the Dusso site, and the um, the um, I'm gonna say earnings, but um, yep. the, the, the sir, right? yeah, right? That is surrounded by wetlands. So all of those parcels have those kind of constraints as well. There are a couple of pieces of parcels on the other side of on that same side of East Hampton Road that are higher and drier, but. I don't know the parcel in particular that you're talking about that's for okay. sale, but it, it's, it wouldn't surprise me if there was some kind of land constraint on it okay. relative to that one. And, uh, what if, just for example, what is there something that would be allowed in a business park zone that would not be allowed in a GI? Uh, well, general industrial sort of is the heart, has more of the hardcore industrial uses allowed, so, um, transport facilities, warehousing, things like that. Business Park is more on the office end of industrial R&D, and, and more similar to office industrial zone. Okay, up further on uh, this on the same street is the plumbing, uh -huh. uh, Wilson Plumbing. What would you, what's, what's your classified that's a that trades. as? I mean, that's kind of, that's a, um, it's a trades use, which is allowed in any of the industrial districts. Well, but it wouldn't be allowed in the Business Park. Um, I think it would be. Right, let me just double check. We just because this is the only area in the city with zoned business park. Yep. We've never had a proposal, so um, I don't often look at the um, allowed uses for business park. So um, I'm pretty sure trades would be allowed, though. Um, While you're looking at the yep. answer, could you just uh, help me out with the connection between that? Oh, my synapses here. Oh, I think there's a question. Don't worry, maybe. And the ordinance and what you're trying to. Well, I just want to make it so restricted um, because I know that. Uh, Trades uses are not allowed in this park. Trades are not? No. So it's just, it seems to be the perfect corridor for something I guess such as that use. Is it going to be re so yeah. restricted? You're concerned and now you can't use it. Right. Gotcha. So now if somebody tried to build that there, they would not be allowed to. And had a hell of a time trying to develop it. I know we did have a grant some number of years ago to run sewer. Down with ten, it was going to it was going to be gravity to East Hampton. And East Hampton was going to uh, treat uh, the sewage. That was about twenty years ago, and for some reason, I don't know what the reason was. We did not uh, we didn't go we 
you can go forward with it. Right. The other piece about going with general, with business park, then you have to figure out sewage, and you have to get sort of a, a system of um, to treat sewage. But if you did individual parcels, like general industrial, then you could potentially just do individual septics, and then you don't have to worry about getting the infrastructure to serve the entire thing, but you could do it on a lot by lot basis. Okay. Which you wouldn't otherwise be able to do in a business park. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Just a general concern. Well, what part is not developable? Um, when I see a lot of there's a big area of business park. Right. It's a huge portion of that. I mean, I would say it's the middle, middle part, part of it, isn't it? it? What's that? Isn't it the middle part of it? It goes, I mean, there's a, basically a swath along the road that's, um, that's um, developable. I'm just trying to go to the map there. But it's really sort of the back, um, the, the middle and back going up the hill towards the, and if you think about it, the other side is the golf course, the Pine, Pine Grove Golf Course, and there's all this water coming off of that hill, and it's coming towards East Hampton Road. Mm -hmm. And there's the Verma Pools, um, I think at least two that have been certified, um, and they're sort of scattered, so then they have a buffer zone, but then in addition to the Verma Pools, there's yeah. um, wetlands and ledge. And, um, so this should make it easier if you get rid of Business Park and make General Industrial, it should be some exactly. development without having without having to have a master plan that takes all that into account. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If I recall mostly we're on the pools that are the limiting factor. Yeah. Make a motion right then. Second. Under a second. Under a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. We're on to the uh, General advertising signs and billboards may not be reconstructed to contain electronic technology. Um, so there are, there are a couple of aspects to this proposed change. The primary one, I guess I would say, is um, a concern about converting, uh, having the billboards convert to LED signage or that any of the new technology that. Um, We've seen for a number of years in other places. Who's, but, who's concerned about that? Uh, well, planning board members. We also had members of the um, public call and say, "Do we have? Do we allow this and that kind of thing?" So, um, you know, obviously, what what happens it, it um, then becomes you could have more of a flashing signs with or rotating. Um, advertising, and then there's more energy consumption. I think primary, obviously the primary concern is sort of the dark sky um, impacts and, and energy consumption. The other piece of the ordinance is um, that all along it's been the um, sort of the um, understanding and enforcement that these billboards would ultimately be amortized um, that, that you couldn't build new billboards in Northampton, and that, that once they fall into disrepair, that they would be gone. Um, and um, but there was there has been in the past on occasion some confusion about whether or not you could take down a billboard and build a new one with new steel structure and framing. So the other piece of this aspect, uh, this um, proposal, is to clarify that the um, what's always sort of been the understanding. Once they're they fall into disrepair, they're gone. Yeah. First of all, I, I just like to I, I fully support this. Um, and I'm glad we're being proactive on this. Rather than have somebody mm -hmm. put something up, it creates such a, a greater problem. They put it up, they put two of them up, because usually somebody owns one of these, might own a couple. And suddenly we're faced with a situation where we don't have any ordinance, and now we're going to write an ordinance specifically to deny it to some person. So I'm really glad this is coming forward now. And I have had um, for a couple of people from my ward in the past number of years. I can't remember who it was, but somebody came from another town 
this also covers signs like uh, Cumberland Farms has, or yeah. uh, or this like Acme Automotive, or something like that? This ordinance is just for billboards, because we have a subsection in the ordinance under signs that are um, called referred to as general advertising, meaning they're not advertising anything that's on the property on which the sign sits. They're advertising something that could be 100 miles away. Um, but we have lighting standards for other signs that are on premise signs, like Cumberland Farms. And they're required to go through. Yeah. So if, <clears throat> if somebody wanted to advertise the, um, the Kingsgate Plaza on Route 91, and it was on Northampton property, they would not be allowed to. To direct right. traffic, they would not be allowed to. You're only allowed to ground, we call these ground signs, the ones that are on the ground, you can only advertise what's on the property, unless it's one of these three or four billboards that have been in existence since whatever, the 50s or 60s. But, then they, can't, but they can't be fixed. Right. Be, they can right. be maintained, can they not? Right. Ordinary maintenance. Right. Right. Replacing they the They can't ads. be upgraded, so, made bigger, right. or... Right. So, hypothetically, if Councilman Tacey went and vandalized the billboard, <laughs> they could repair the billboard. Yes. The yes. Or, yes. or once a sign falls into disrepair or requires reframing to meet safety standards, it must be eliminated. Yeah. And this is perhaps one jump ahead of the gaming signs that might want to be oh. encouraged further <laughs> down the road. Potentially, I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> Yeah, it actually might be an interesting idea for the mayor to speak to the mayor of the surrounding areas to we might want to let them know what we're doing here because that could be. I think Springfield's already allowing that. Well, Springfield maybe, but not Holyoke, East Hampton, and maybe we could uh, pass this on to them. Um, do I hear other questions first? Yeah, I, I haven't quite wrapped my head around volume of disrepair or reframing if somebody's got something and they want to fix it. I don't see why they would that. Yeah, but if it blows over in a hurricane, then that's something else again, yeah? Um, uh, you know, there, it's funny, I had a discussion with the um, city solicitor about it because I think it would fall under the grandfathering allowances for think structures that um, have, uh, have that impacted by natural disaster because it's in the zoning ordinance. If the city had a separate ordinance that said, you know, if tornado comes and takes your sign down, you're done, the city could adopt an ordinance that's separate out of zoning. It's not grandfathered because it's not within the jurisdiction or wasn't adopted under the zoning ordinance. So, let me, maybe this will answer your question a little more. So, in disrepair, can you describe to me? Signage started to be in disrepair, started to rot out. I and I own the sign. I can repair it. So the what case would it be if, if, if I just leave it, you walk and, it can, and I walk away from it? Yeah. And I, mm -hmm. Right. And it rotted and started and it rotted falling. So that's the one case right. that no, that would happen. Well, I'm curious. What about this other part? It requires refraining to meet safety standards. Well, I mean, say, so if the frames, if the frame is rotting, if it's a wooden structure and it's falling apart, you can't put it back up. The intent was that once the billboards fall apart, we, the city didn't want them um, to be put back up because it's an eyesore on the interstate. Well, what, if this, what if safety standards change? Um, what if you're in compliance and then safety standards, in compliance and then safety standards change? from the federal government or the state government. You need to be more Restricted. stringent. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, it's meant to be whatever those six safety standards are, you know, as, as they do change. Just like when the building code changes, you know, at, at, at some could, point they're triggered. I couldn't vote for this one. No, okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'll be blunt. I mean, this is somebody's personal property. And it seems like this is something that we're trying to eliminate. Um, this is, it's, it's, um, I want to be clear, there, there are two sections. So the one is clarification of what's always been the um, understood reading of the ordinance. 
um, and that the, the cities and towns do have the jurisdiction to say that billboards are treated separately from other things, that you can, and this goes back to the 60s when there, were, there was action to eliminate high, highway billboards all throughout the country. Um, so this language is really just to clarify what has always been understood from, at least from our office and for the most part the building department. But other people haven't had, haven't always interpreted that way. So it's meant to clarify. So if, I mean, I, if that doesn't sit well with you, I mean, it makes sense to have a community conversation about it. I do want to, um, I would say that if there is a concern about, in terms of adopting it, that the measure about the lighting is, is more so important at out. this point. So you can separate out the two separate. Separate. Okay. sections. So we, we may, I, I would suggest we do that in a moment. But and one thing is, I'm not operating as the chair like you do in the city council, correct? I'm just a regular talking member. I, I would support this because, in fact, it does come from this movement to eliminate billboards. And I think we should have the right at the town to do that. I wish that the state would do that. I would question anybody driving to Vermont or driving to New Hampshire to tell me that the roads on Vermont are in a much more attractive place to be in a few states than probably on billboards. Yes, it's somebody's personal property, but it's also something that the entire community looks at. It's very unique. And that it's directed towards us. And um, so I would very much support this. And I wish we could actually get rid of the billboards that we do have uh, currently. And if there was a way to do that and reimburse, and we certainly can't afford it. But I would support that because I support the value behind it. Just an answer to that. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's so many billboards here that's a problem. Okay? No. So, and I, 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 I'm not, I'm not going to support this um, just because I don't, I don't think it's clear enough. I think um, I'm just. And I, I'm not, I, it's just my personal, yeah. I'm not looking to. So, so first, can we separate out the two yeah. or go with the electric? Would you, can I just make a motion? Yes, that would be great. Thank, Thank you. you. Can, we make, can I make a motion that in the sentence that starts with once a sign fails, falls into disrepair, mm -hmm. we just strike every, the, from or mm -hmm. to standards, we just strike or required reframing to mean safety standards? Just strike that so it would read once a sign falls into disrepair, it must be eliminated. Because, because, because you have a problem with if there's some safety issue, they should be able to keep going. Yes. With? What is may, the may I recommend first? Could, could I have a motion to move this if it's okay? That we separate the two pieces. And it seems like a controversial piece is this piece. Could we first deal with, as Carolyn suggested, the piece that has to do with the electronic changes. So just adding the last sentence. Just approve the last sentence. Yes. Recommending the last sentence. Recommending the last <laughs> sentence. And then we would, rec we would move this forward in two different pieces. To the <coughs> I agree. I don't, I don't want flashing lights. Okay. So can we can we have a motion for that? And, and I would draw my motion. But you may want to put it back yeah, in when we come to that. I would draw it. So I, I need a motion. Okay, so I move to separate, but well, is that the, I mean, you want to recommend this last sentence? There we go. I, I second. move to recommend the last sentence. <laughs> and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, opposed? Okay, so now uh, perhaps a motion, and then this may be where you'd like to put in your language. Right. Okay. We need a motion for the first part. Okay, so first we need a motion um, to recommend the entire piece, then you will add it as a, as a first, change. We need a re motion to recommend. The two sentences in the first. Are you doing it? Would you like to do that? No, but I want to amend it. Okay, because so I'll move to recommend this first I'll paragraph. Second. I'll second for a second. Okay. I'd, I'd like to make a motion that we delete from or to the end of standards on the second sentence that's being added. Oh, no, second. Second. Okay, thank you. So um, my, my point is that. I, I would, if, if I, I understand the desire to eliminate or to um, limit and slowly uh, <coughs> retire billboards, but I, I also feel for the business owner um, who has a piece of real estate that he or she scrupulously maintains um, or tries to maintain, but then when the state changes, the state or the federal government changes the standards regarding billboards they are unable to bring them into compliance because of this. 
this, this ordinance. So that is what I'm trying to avoid. That that really unfortunate taking. I think that. Councilman, do you have any knowledge of any time in the recent decades where the standards of safety on the billboards have changed radically? That might no. affect this. So one of the things that could happen then is a signage could just sit out there in disrepair. And how do you then evaluate it? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, so, those standards of safety have changed. Right, I wasn't talking about I'm eliminating all signs of disrepair. What's that? I haven't talked about falling into disrepair. Just the required to refrain from this safety, safety standards. I mean, these are all judgment calls that the building yeah. commission, I assume the zoning board of appeals would, would have to deal with. But for me, the, the part that where you understand that you're maintaining or you're trying to maintain your, your structure and then you have to, you know, you're not allowed to use, you're not allowed to have it anymore really just because of, of a new mandate. So let's, uh, we can take a vote on the, on on the amendment. amendment. On the amendment is all in favor? Aye. We're, we're still in discussion. Still in discussion. <laughs> <laughs> so they keep, but they that's what I'm trying to talk more. I just need to think for a second. Um, Carolyn, do you want to speak to this bill? Do you have any, yeah. any thoughts about it? <laughs> Since the language has been in there as an operational language for a long time. Yeah, I mean, um, I think, again, it, yeah, I mean, disrepair, it would be a judgment call either way. Um, so I don't know that it really... Um, I don't think it detracts from the oh, language so at all. So I, I, I don't. If a higher authority, as it were, the state raised standards, then it, it, the city wouldn't be at issue. The owner would have to to come to those standards. Right. right. There's an outdoor advertising body at the Commonwealth level that um, permits. Um, what slipped through there was a unanimous vote. What can we do to pass the amendment? Okay. okay, can we do a general discussion on this? Yes, absolutely. I wouldn't, I don't, I don't know about adding this right now because we're, you might want to take it through the planning board, but I, just to speak extemporaneously, if there was something that said, you know, obviously or the sign fails to meet the standards by the, by the, that the state has, yeah. then we can, you know, something, okay. something like that. That might be, they lose their permit from the state, then you can't repair it or something like that. Or that might be an interesting piece where, where you don't have the the owner maintaining it to the best to the up to standard, but not it, but it, it fails to go into disrepair. So would we be able to put up a billboard or so, or somebody from the city or or private that for the hotel in Northampton uh, off of Route 91 on Northampton property, anything like that? No new billboards are allowed in the city. So the ones that are there are the only ones that can be maintained until such time as. I know I travel back and forth to Florida, and you know, and I depend on those sites to send me in the right direction. But that's like this isn't Florida, so. Well, well, we also have the mass highway signs that are, you know, say at this exit. Yep, hotel I, see, yep I see those too. Yep. Well, you take the take for example the. Uh, Bike path bridge. Yeah. Going to Stanford. There are other bike path bridges across the country that pay for pay for half the maintenance of, on the path by using a building. Yeah. But you can't do that here. Really can't do it that long. <laughs> okay. <coughs> I'm ready. So we're ready to move on to the move the question. The question. to address floodplain standards throughout the city. 
um, the, and to ensure that the standards that we use for um, all our floodplains are the same for development, um, at least as it relates to residential areas. Um, so uh, this is sort of bringing that back um, because it was, it was never um, implemented at that time. And the, so the, the main goals, as, as I said, are really to sort of um, um, make sure we're treating all these floodplain areas um, similarly. And so what it would do is um, where there are certain rivers and streams throughout the, the city where we have, um, well, I, I guess I should take a step back. All of the perennial streams in the city are, have a land use zone associated with them that cover the stream plus approximately 100 feet on either side. This was adopted back in the early 70s before FEMA mapping was ever in existence. So it was sort of an arbitrary number um, to create these swaths, and that's what the light blue um, fingers are throughout, and it's on the map that you received um, as well, the same map. Um, so then, a little bit later, FEMA came along and mapped the major river corridors. And so, um, in some cases, our watershed protection zone is um, a little bit broader than where FEMA mapped more specifically. They came in and did detailed studies to figure out the floodplain areas, whereas our zoning classification was sort of a broad brush um, attempt at trying to address flooding concerns that would arise on these um, perennial brooks and streams. Um, so on the map, as you, if you can see this, I can turn off the light if you need to see it better, but the, um, the light blue um, lines are <coughs> the areas that are currently zoned watershed protection but not have not been mapped by FEMA. Um, the darker blue, the royal blue areas are all the um, FEMA mapped portions of the streams and rivers. I call purple. I think we're all seeing purple. I was going to say that. I have a pointer. All in favor of calling it purple. Yeah. Okay, fine. Purple. Tomatoes. It's getting to it. Okay, so here. Do you want to retake that vote?
So the yellow, what represents the area that's going to shrink out of our watershed protection zone or any kind of floodplain zoning. Um, and in the light, going back to the light blue, that these fingers <coughs> were never um, mapped by FEMA, but we want to keep them in a protective zone because they represent um, right along stream banks where we have um, flash flooding and other um, problems. So we want to make sure we're not encouraging <coughs> new residential development in those areas. So there are many people, as you can see this whole um, map, there are many people that have streams running through their yards. We have notified 1,065 property owners about this zone change because sometimes their house might be the front of the lot, the stream is in the back, but the zone will still change in the back even though it has no effect on their house or um, their yard or anything. Um, and um, the other piece of it is the areas in red are where watershed protection, which is you now an overlay zone, is on top of a commercial district. So the red would simply be, represents the area that's going to be a name change only. It will be, go to FP, the floodplain, so it's clear what the zoning is all about, because nobody knows what WP stands for. Mm -hmm. in the, when you went to the south of the property owners, yep. was, I forget, and why was it pulled before? Was there a connection with that? Was there concern about this? And what were the concerns for property owners? Well, it wasn't. It actually went to council for a vote, and there were some councilors that weren't present. There were, there, I think there was confusion about yeah. what the intent of the ordinance was. Um, and so the planning board and various committees voted um, with positive recommendations, but when it got to council floor, it didn't get the vote. So um, then, um, we decided, well, maybe we could do some more outreach. You know, let time pass, bring it up again. Yeah. Because the, one of the big issues is there are a lot of, there are several, I don't know how many, homeowners who own homes that are in these zones, watershed protection zones, and their older homes been there for decades and decades. But they, um, because of the land use zoning and the Wetlands Protection Act, um, requirements and the building code requirements for building a floodplain. They have three, potentially three permit processes that are all intermixed and overlapping that yeah. they have to go through. What this would do actually is for those homeowners, it eliminates the planning board special permit process because we've already established in the special conservancy district that we don't want to restrict people who have been in their homes and they've been there forever and ever. We don't want to add, keep adding on layers of permits when they already have to comply with floodplain standards through these other mechanisms um, or jurisdictions. Um, so in this case, so, um, it would make it easier for homeowners, and I think there may have been some confusion at that time about what it was going to do. It does more clearly say we don't want any more new homes in floodplains. So even though it's been a policy and in, wet, in watershed protection, it says you need a special permit for a new, new construction or substantial improvement. It never said outright don't apply to the planning board, but the fact is the planning board has never issued a permit for a new house in the watershed protection district. Um, so this is, um, so in that case, it's just, it's also clarifying because it's saying what the policy has always been. Yeah, um, I remember the argument um, very well at the council. Special Conservancy allows no construction, is that correct? No. It doesn't allow new homes, but it allows expansions of existing homes. It allows, in some cases, um, so long as you're meeting the building code requirements for building within a floodplain, um, and allows um, accessory apartments, which it hadn't um, before then. Detached accessories. Yes. Well, detached accessory um, is a special permit, and also you have to meet building code standards and floodplain um, development center, so it's not clear that you could do that anyway because of, you know, you have to do what's called compensatory flood storage if you're building in a floodplain. And when I made the argument at the city council about it a couple of years ago, and, this, it was, and I asked the question about whether or not you could build it all in special conservancy, it was a no, you could not. Um, I don't, I don't recall that, um, I, I don't recall that answer or that question. 
question okay. about it, but yeah. it, But are you saying that, that that's not the correct answer? You cannot build new homes in the Special Conservancy okay. District. So that may have been the question, and that is absolutely true. We don't want to put new residential okay. homes in a okay. pipeline. Okay. So. Right. so you can't build one family. That's not very reasonable. It's not the new home. Right. Yeah. Wait. It says here that accessory apartments to a single family. Um, Could you say that again? It says that accessory apartments. I'm looking at the table of use um, regulations. The um, there's page. a footnote that says within existing homes as of 2005. 10, 350, 10, 10. Right, and there's, it says um, no, but there's a, um, there's a footnote oh, okay, that says right. for existing homes. And so then the same thing for detached accessory units. You can build detached? If you, well, you need a zoning board of appeals, and it's only for homes that existed. And, of course, then you still have to show that you're meeting the comp storage requirements under the Homeless um, Protection what? Act yeah. Yeah. and building code requirements for building in a flood, in a flood plain. So those would be the only scenarios in which you could put a new residential unit, but it would be only associated with an existing home that was in existence. In yeah. I, I, I agree. I don't want anybody to build it. A house in a bloodline. That is a given. Um, and I just think about what they go through or, or what other. This does not put any more layers of anything on property owners. Um, actually, it eliminates for property owners that are um, have already have homes, it eliminates a planning board special permit. Because right now in the watershed protection, any substantial improvement, which means anything that would add 15% value to a property, triggers a planning board special permit. But then you also have to go to the Conservation Commission, and you also have to meet very similar standards under the building code. So it wipes out the planning board special permit, which is a you know three-month process, a fee, a, you know review, and all of that. Wait for Kevin to chime in here. <laughs> well, I have. Uh, this is fine. The only thing I will point out um, is that eliminating the yellow to go back to the FEMA standards. Uh, FEMA standards were established in what year? 1974. Right. And the rainfall since 74 has been uh, far greater. And so what this, the purple is a 10-year floodplain? No. Purple is 100 and yeah. 500. I couldn't see how many zeros are on there. <laughs> it's and so the, the one difference I said this is a slight this is basically the same as the previous ordinance in 2009. The one thing that we have um, changed in this is that um, instead of pairing back to the FEMA 100 year flood plain, we paired it back to 500. And so now under the building code, you don't have to build to standards if you're in between 100 and 500. But because of the significant rainfall changes, and because we know we're not really taking care of that problem as quickly as we need to, that it doesn't make sense to take it down to the 100 when FEMA already mapped at 500. Yeah. And so. it, 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 uh, it won't change the hurdles people are going to have to jump through for all practical purposes. I mean, the, right. the riparian area of 200 feet right. of, outside rivers isn't going to change. Right. You know, the per permitting process for us isn't going to change. Right. The comp storage isn't going to change. All, all those hurdles. So the purple encompasses 100 to 500 year flood plain. Yes. And the yellow is just? Was additional watershed protection zoning that had been mapped prior to when FEMA came through. And so we're taking that out of any kind of zone classification. Right. Again, yeah, FEMA, this was mapping by FEMA. 74, 75. Okay. Just remind me. So FEMA came through in the 70s, clearly, and, didn't, and all the light blue, they didn't think? Uh, they didn't go that far for whatever reason at the time. OK. But the city does. Right. Yeah. And they were mapping, so they were mapping to this, you know, the 1% chance of a flood in any given um, time was is the purple. The other that doesn't that doesn't um, address any kind of flash flooding that might happen in any storm, um, and it's it really actually.
actually is almost, um, it's actually less than the jurisdiction the Conservation Commission has now anyway, anywhere, um, when they, which is 200 feet from the edge of the stream down. So this is generally about 100 feet from the stream on either side. So you're saying that this is, it's kind of consolidating two concerns. One is flood, risk of flood, and the second is protection of weather. It's really the watershed protection district has always been um, uh, about floodplain protection of floodplain. So some, yes, yeah, some of the issues are overlapping with the wetlands protection, but it's for the purposes of um, allowing buffers for flooding to happen around streams and to keep people away from that event. So, I, so the concept you were saying. Convince me that the light blue isn't Northampton over, overreaching when it comes to flood protection. Just convince me. Because um, the federal government only is concerned about the purple. So why, why are we so concerned about the light blue? I, I, I imagine I'm playing devil's advocate, because yeah. I am. But just, what's going on here? <clears throat> well, again, so the mapping was done prior to that to sort of address all the perennial streams, because we know that flooding happens even in um, perennial streams, but they might not, you know, the FEMA, and, and I'm not an expert in, in engineering around floodplains, but, you know, it's a certain level elevation of water, 1% chance of getting to that elevation of water in any, you know, given um, rain event. So, you you know, that's that was their standard. They had to stop at some place. But that doesn't mean that, you know, it's six feet here, and then we're stopping, we're stopping the mapping. It's still going to be gradual. I mean, you're still going to have flooding beyond that because it's, you know, you, you don't just instantly get to six feet and then you're at your 100 year flood level. And on top of that, it's only gotten worse. Um, so I think, in terms of, if you're thinking about, well, let's pair back from the 70s, we've gotten many more, um, um, we've seen many more problems on different stream corridors that were never really, never seemed to be a problem before because of upstream development and um, impervious surface um, well beyond and then yeah. really coming down. So. I know that we had doubled, almost doubled the rainfall amount since 1974. I know that from the stormwater. And Councilor, you spoke to this a bunch. Of yeah. Many of these streams back in 74 might not have been a problem, but we're finding probably because of other development, other runoff. Yes. We are, these are developing yeah. really pretty major problems. It, it was interesting in the paper a few days ago, it, 25 years ago, it talked about two developers that tried to develop the 26 acres off of Cook Avenue, mm -hmm. which is where Lakeland right. is. And it was shot down because of drainage and things such as that, and streams and public health private. It was, it was in the newspaper, but I found it interesting because we were, we're engaged in it right now, and um, uh, so I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around all this drainage in the city, and I think maybe and this probably has a lot to do with it too. And we are engaged right now in trying to fix it somehow. Can you where, can you show me on that uh, map where Bridge Road is? Yeah, um, right here, this pipeline here. So this is the stream that runs. This is Cook Avenue right yep. here and Hatfield Street. So here's the street, the brook that runs there, and then empties out into the Connecticut over here. That's one. That's one of our. That's one of our big concern areas right now. One of the. It's one of the biggest in the city. And Austin Circle, mm -hmm. which is off of Ryan Road. Okay. That's the. I forget which one it is. Yeah, is whatever the Ryan Road School might be. It's right it's behind school. it. Oh, Austin Circle. There it is. There's that, there's that, that loop right up there. Yeah. yeah. And that's not part of that. It's, but that's full no, of water right now. It wasn't feet. mapped as a perennial brook, no. Okay. So just to address your question because we sit in the joint committee with the and I know you've had a, you keep bringing up these streets and when we've been talking about storm drain drainage stuff, people have come in from all over the city talking about what's been happening throughout the city. I, I think we have a, even a greater problem than is than, than is identified on this map. I'm not sure it's, it has to do with wetland protection, but we certainly need to be looking at this and right now go err on the side of caution, I think, right now in terms of these areas where we do even have little streams. Um, I think that's, that's what seems to be coming forward in the, 
that these little streams are getting bigger. And, and the majority of the council did not support this at the last one, when, when it came before it last night. Now, was it a majority or did it just not have yeah, a I don't think it was that. Oh, yeah, we voted. Did we vote it? Yeah, it didn't have enough votes. Yeah, it didn't have enough votes to pass. Because you needed you six. Needed six. The, the majority of the council, I guess, that was there. <laughs> right. Well, you needed two thirds. You needed two thirds. Right. Yeah. So you need six and a majority. You failed to reach it. You failed to reach Okay. So, um, any more discussion? Yeah, I will do it. You would recommend it here second? Yeah. I'd like, I'd like to bring it to the full council for okay. that discussion. Um, there's a motion to recommend. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. I hate to kick it around here for another hour and then bring it to the council and do the same thing again. Uh, so this is language. The next thing is 350-4.4 language regarding home occupation to be amended to be consistent with current home business. Yeah, this is just the cleanup language yeah. from the last one that we did. We've got... <coughs> We, um, there's one more, uh, there's no longer, it's no longer necessary to have this piece in there because we removed and we moved right. home business stuff to another section. So I just it's found really, this left over. It's clerical stuff. So, yeah. Does everybody get, get this? Yeah. We, we've knocked this around all yeah. right. Okay. Are, are there any questions on this one? I'm yes. Sure. I thought there might be. When, um, we haven't had a motion to move directly. Sorry. Okay, um, is, the, is the city council going to see the recommendation from planning to uh, add uh, personal services into the uh, home business classification anytime soon? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I think that was added when the whole thing got adopted. Mm, I don't think so. I think it. I think it was not. Um, it's, oh, it's, oh, 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 you know, um, actually, I'm sorry, I think it's in, <coughs> um, I have to go and look, but I think it's in the A, B, and C zoning, um, proposed zoning changes, the text in the table, because it's part of oh, the, next the home way. business, right, so I think, I, I, if I remember correctly, I'm trying to keep all these straight, um, I think we did put it in there. Um, it's separate. I think it's, it is. It is separate. But it is in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> Glad you had that. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's just related. It's not <laughs> right. It's not part of this, but it's related. But it's in the same classification. Are you satisfied with it? Well, it, we'll see when it's we'll satisfied. We'll see when we see it. We'll see when it comes to Any other questions on this? The motion's already been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Moving right along, we're now at uh, 350J, water supply protection, larger accessory structures allowed addressing mistakes in attached garage setbacks, yeah. relaxing photovoltaic structure standards, right? Okay. So would you... Uh, so a lot of this is clean up, but some of it is incorporating um, changes that we've been talking about as we're moving the A, B, and C districts forward. Right. Um, so the first is an important cleanup that when we went through and made the water supply protection table changes, we inadvertently um, kept attached structures at four <coughs> feet of the property line, which was never the intention and it was never, it's never been that close to property lines. We've always had at least a, a minimum of a 10 foot setback for attached garages and we're so um, um, just clarifying that there is a difference. If you have a detached garage, you can be closer to the property line, where if it's attached to your house, it has to be a little bit further away. Um, and um, then the other piece of it is um, for the garages, um, we currently, throughout the entire city, for whatever residential district, a detached garage maximum square footage is a thousand and over the years we've had people um, request larger uh, there is an exemption for agricultural uses so if you're a farm you can have a zillion <coughs> farms and we're not going to count the square footage but for everyone else who's not farming um, you might have a 10 acre 
piece of land on which you have your single family home and you're limited to a thousand square feet of footprint for a garage. Um, so uh, there's been some discussion over the years about creating more flexibility for, for those situations. So this is a proposal to um, allow either a thousand square feet or 3% of lot area, whichever is greater. So obviously if you have an in-town lot of 5,000 square feet, you can have 1,000 square foot garage that's much more than 3% coverage. Um, whereas if you have another lot that's 10 acres and you're still limited to 1,000, you're way under um, you know, the same, it's not an equal percent. So, you know, um, I don't really have anything more to say about that piece except that we know we've had requests for more than, and if you, and I think original, I don't know, it wasn't around um, when this original cap was put in place for, for um, accessory structures, but I assume it was that you didn't want lots to just be filled up with accessory boxes um, in addition to the principal structure of the house. And how does all that pertain to, open, to the open space? Well, you still, it doesn't change anything about open space. So um, you still need to meet your minimum open space, which is different in different districts. But in the urban districts, it's around, it's between 30 and 50% open space. And in the outlying areas, it's higher, 60 or 70% open space. So you still need to meet that. But it will give you a little bit more wiggle room to have, you know, your guest quarters or your storage of all your equipment that you need to take care of your tankers. So uh, so if, even if you had enough room to go larger than a thousand square feet on your property, if it was in the city here, downtown, right. you couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Right. Even if you stayed underneath, even if you stayed within your open space requirement, right. you still couldn't do it. Right. And I'm just looking for reasoning. Um, if we're going to change it for some, because they got a bigger lot, somebody else might have a, a hobby that would like to put another 100 square feet on their garage and they can't. Right, so I think the 3% allows that flexibility to go beyond 1,000 square feet if you needed to, and you're still meeting your open space requirement. I mean, 1,000 square feet, I, mean, I consider it pretty big, especially for an in-town lot. I mean, it's 20% yeah. of your, it could be. Yeah. 20% of your But I mean, if Owen was restoring antique cars and he had his garage was too small, uh, could he, as a, as a hobby, could he expand his garage if he wanted to and he'd still be within the, uh, still maintain his open space requirement? He might want to be a little bigger than a thousand feet. He couldn't do it. If, well, if it were, you know, if he if he hit a thousand feet before three percent, then no. Um, and the idea is, you don't want, particularly in town, you don't want these garage spaces to, you know, um, be the yeah. front and yeah. present okay. structure on the lot. Okay. <laughs> now, <coughs> in this doesn't change. Accessory use, like, like an in-law apartment yeah. in a garage. Um, well, no. I mean, the other thing, the other thing that this would address is um, that we hadn't that you could then um, go bigger if you wanted to do an accessory apartment because people were bumping up against a thousand square feet because they already had a garage and they wanted to do another accessory apartment and they couldn't because they'd already absorbed the allotment in that one structure. So but, it does potentially allow that. Okay, and on your setbacks, how how close to the line could it be your garage for a living space if you were going to make that into? It needs to be 15 feet now. And now is the requirement. Okay, 15 feet from the side lot line. The living space does. Yeah. If the garage was within 10 feet, we can't do you that. You could be five feet in. No, you have to. The, the whole structure has to be 15 feet because things morph over time. And no, it used to, but, but, but that used to be the, the rule. No, it's always been the rule. The structure has to be 15 feet from okay. the side. All right, thank and you. And I, I mean, I'm saying I think the reason for that is because you can't, it's very hard to regulate what goes on inside the structure once it's built. 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. trying to figure out this next part about the photovoltaic. Oh, okay, sure. Um, so we had, so the planning board, so the allowance for ground mounted photovoltaics is relatively a new ordinance. It got passed, I don't know, last year maybe. And there was a special permit requirement for each of these things. Well, we've seen many individual homeowners come forward who want to do ground mounted systems and it triggers a special permit, and then they want to do more than what the zoning originally allowed. So I think this is sort of, sort of the next step, um, because they've seen a, a multiple permits for these things, and, it, and it's becoming clear that it's burdensome for individual homeowners to have to go through this permit process to add these ground-mounted systems. Um, so um, this one does, it, it allow, it also, there was a cap of 200 percent uh, of, of um, annual projected use. Um, and so what this does is it separate, it creates two different classifications of ground mounted systems. One, if you're just create, if you're just putting a system on your property to generate your own power, not necessarily to become sort of almost an energy production for other properties, um, then you don't need a planning board special permit. So it eliminates the planning board special permit for sort of a lower threshold category of ground mounted solar systems. Then the second one is anything that's beyond 100% of your use and up to 200% is what would trigger a special permit. So the planning board started seeing these things for people who just wanted to cr um, produce energy for their own consumption, their own use, and it was creating a special permit sort of threshold. So this is just sort of saying, if you want to create more and you know sell it back to the grid and be a little mini production company, then you need a special permit. But if you're just doing it for yourself, fine, we think it's a good idea. This actually overlaps with the work done by the uh, Energy Commission because right. anybody who's putting up their solar for themselves does not want to be producing more than 100%. Because of the whole way it's structured in, in the state of Massachusetts is that a homeowner, when you put it up, because of the whole SREX and paying back and credits, anybody putting it up on their own house for their own property is going to do it. And, and they're going to be advised, Northeast Solar, who I just met, will tell you, keep it at like 80 or 90 percent because of the way the whole financing is structured. I think this in part ties into that. And that's what makes some logical sense. If you're starting to go over that 100 percent threshold, you're saying, well, you, you actually need to have, if you go over the hundred percent, it actually doesn't get bought back the same way. So you'd be in a different category. You'd right. actually be producing. Well, you get less so money. You get less money, but you actually would have a different. You'd be in a different category when you start going over there, going over that threshold. Right. So, so originally, our zoning though said, we'll just allow you to go up to two hundred percent, but you're right. going to need a special permit no matter what. And so what the board was finding, and then Energy Commission was um, um, at least. Staff anyway was saying, "Hey, we're advising these homeowners to go and get solar, and now you're telling them they have to go through this three-month process to get their special permit." Blah blah blah. So then, so we sort of they worked with, we sat down with the planning planning board and energy commission staff sat down and sort of talked through the details, and and they were able to see a few of these permits come through and realize that, you know, these smaller scale ones are not a problem. We shouldn't be requiring special. The permits. only question I would have is, why even do anything for the one hundred? Because even a 200, a doubling of what you would use in your own home is still not really industrial use. I understand it's not, you're in a different category, but, and, and I don't mind it being in there. Just what was the rationale for just saying, let's just make it for anyone putting up, because that's still a small unit. Yeah. Anyone doing a small unit, let's not make it a special unit. Well, I think the issue is, oh, the other piece of it is, is reducing setbacks significantly. So they were like 50 feet, 50 yeah. foot setbacks, okay. even in urban there. districts. Yeah. But I think the issue still is, let's take this one step at a time. We don't know what you know they look like. They might really have a negative impact in terms of a visual impact on a neighborhood for bigger systems. So the board, the planning board anyway, was reluctant to take away the entire special permit, particularly for the ones that are sort of beyond the 100%. So what the melt up? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. 
uh, I just help me read this. If, if it generates no more than 100% or 8 kilowatt hours, or 8 kilowatts, excuse me. Um, if you're above 8 but you're not at 100%, what do you get? So if, no, if it's either or. If so if, it's, if you're not at 100% and you're at 8, then you can go by right. You don't have to go to the time point. Not 100%. But if it's over you're 8 or if it's, over If you're 100% is it's, if you're at 6 kilowatts per year and you want to go to 8, you can do that. Time. Right. I think the issue was more that, so you know, this, they're getting more and more efficient, so they wanted to have either a percentage <coughs> or the kilowatt because, um, you might be with less as the technology changes. It might take less um, so, to get more to get 100 percent or more. <laughs> just I, don't, I, I guess I don't understand why why the eight is there, right? If, that was recommended by staff, Energy Commission staff, as we're talking to Northeast Solar people. Right, but, but, but what is it there for? Is it a limit? Is it a lower limit or an upper limit? You could be 100% and not be at 8. Is that right. But what if you're at 100% at 12? 8, if you're over 8, then that you wouldn't, have to have that to Apparently, it. that wouldn't happen now because the technology. Well, I think that that's, okay. I, I don't know about that. What I would suggest, I can't explain this either, but if you want to follow up, I mean, we sort of came to that number talking to Northeast Solar and Chris. And the, put the Melnick photovoltaic array in perspective here. He got a special permit. I don't know what his kill was, or I, I honestly, he was the first one to come through. Where is this? He, my actually, board. he was up to 200% because he was applying for that level because he's producing for his office and wherever else. Yeah. So he's over the 100% for sure. I just don't know what the, the number, the kilowatt number is. So he had to get a special one. Yeah. Yeah. He made some arrangement where he would get the power at his office. Yeah. And it wasn't, it wasn't a buyback or a swap or he just produced... And his office is not on the property. His office is on King Street. Yeah, you can do that. That's a whole other story. That's yeah. how they work with this. You can get someone to sign a contract that they're going to buy your electricity if you're producing it. And how would that affect how this would affect that, wouldn't it? Well, that's what the 100% is, because you're not, you're, where you're producing it is for your house. If you're producing it and you have extra to put elsewhere, then that's beyond the 100%. If you're, if you're producing what you're using. Yeah. On that he's, property. On that particular piece right. of property. Jim, that, I'm just saying, that issue is, is this kind of separate from this. Yeah. He well, probably made an arrangement to do that so that he has somebody so he can get the SRX back. Yeah. Well, that's, well, that's what I was getting at. Like, why wouldn't you want to allow that um, if somebody has a, an office or something like that? Why would you? Well, I think the explanation from right, you is would. that you're you trying to go cautiously. Yeah. And you start to put it to, yeah. if I understand, that was my question yeah. too. But you're saying, Look, we don't really know now. These units are getting efficient, and if, our, if we put up two, if something's two hundred percent, it might be a size that we still want the special permit. Whereas at one hundred percent, we're kind of saying that seems to be reasonable. If, if I'm yeah. understanding this correctly, and we're kind of in a new world here, trying to understand what this is going to be like visually. And up to two hundred percent is still allowed. It's just you need a planning board special permit. Anything that's just for your own property, you can go by right. You don't have to come to the planning board anymore. So that's the distinction that this ordinance would do in the Water Supply Protection District for now. And as we bring the A, B, and C districts forward, we've incorporated the same language in those tables as well. Okay, so I know water and electricity don't mix, uh, but could you put this in Special Conservancy? <laughs> could we put it in Special Conservancy? Yeah, I mean, in photovoltaics. It's to... already in there. So we've done it for the entire city, but um, we're addressing the residential districts as we get to them, and since we had to make those other cleanup changes in WSP, we went ahead and threw in the PV stuff, too. Okay. I guess, I guess, I'm oh, sorry. First, uh, I want to follow up on your question. I was about what they ate, and I don't know anything about how these, uh, these generating capacity is designated, but if that literally means 8,000 uh, watts, then 
I just did a little quick research, and Massachusetts residents, the average is seven and a half kilowatts a year. So this eight is nice for the average, but I, I don't know why we wouldn't write it to say to generate no more than eight kilowatt hours or 100%, so that if you happen to be a family that that generates more than eight, but it's or that needs more than eight, that you can get that amount as long as it's under or at one hundred percent of your usage, your projected usage. I don't know. I don't. I don't understand how that's different than what's written. Then let's change it. Yeah, but I think let's, let's, can you clarify? I think you asked us the US this question earlier. Is the language here saying you either can do 100% or you can do a kilowatt? Is that what it says? Or is it saying you can do 100% or you can do one up to eight? Yeah. Because that's what I think you're saying. I think you're saying you can do 100% up to eight. And I prefer it to be you can do eight or 100%. And that's what it says 100% or eight. So, ah, okay. I know where you're coming from. What you I, said I earlier, though, wasn't what you said right now. Okay, okay. that's good. So it's 100%. It is, that's the language. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's what, I hope so. Well, maybe it was just a translation. Would there be any appetite to remove the eight kilowatts? Would there be one? Yeah, sure. No, because the reason I wouldn't do that is we're still trying to work out what the visuals are going to be on this. No, but but you're right. saying that's, wait. that's right. That's that's the only reason, so far as I can see. It's the visual. It's the view shed. Right, and these systems are getting more and more efficient as people and as the building code and stretch code gets implemented, the the um, the need, the demand is going to be dropping. Um, so then you could potentially be generating more energy for off-site uses. So I think that was the reason why the two had been included. The demand will be dropping. Because your house is going to be more and more, become more and more efficient, yeah. and the technology is changing. Um, and so, um, you know, at, at um, you might be able to produce more than 100% yeah. One, one suggestion, maybe what we could do is to recommend that when or, or ask that when this comes forward to the city council that Chris Mason could be here as well. That might help just to explain mm -hmm. this. Um, if we have I'd, questions about this. I'd, I'd like to recommend it um, in theory, like it's written, but maybe yeah. we might be able to do something with the council or, or something. Okay, and it's going, going somewhere to place. Oh, yeah. Okay. The public hearing will be Monday, right. okay. the 11th. Okay. Given the time and the... Yeah. As long as, it's, as long as you can, if you, if you happen to be a more significant energy consumer that you can generate, you can put voltaic ground down to cells that generate over 8 kilowatts. Um, yeah, if that it's all for your own consumption, that's, yeah, that, then, then I'm, I'm fine. And is the answer to that yes? Yeah. That's what I'm. That's you're producing 12, but you're at only 78 percent. So you'd be okay. You don't feel this way. Okay. We all set on that. Uh, did we already have a motion? I'm sorry. No, we didn't have a motion. Entertain a motion. I move here. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Separate them out for some reason. We can always do that. Would that be it? See, there's language between us, right? 
Well, there's a language cleaning up, except there's one addition. Um, Could you just focus on the addition? If yes. The rest is language cleanup. The addition is in the special permit and the site plan section. Okay. Um, and I would say they can go together because they relate to um, when you file for an application to the planning office um, and the planning board, you also, for a special permit or site plan, you submit plans. The change is that um, right now we require, and by state statute we can, and by local ordinance we do, require decisions to be recorded at the Registry of Deeds. So it's the actual permit decision is recorded at the Registry of Deeds. But we don't have a requirement that the plan to which the decision references be re-recorded. So you have this decision and five years from now someone says, oh, it was based on this other plan. Where is that plan? So this is a requirement that the plan also get recorded um, at the Registry of Deeds. And so we have two sections. We have the special permit section and the site plan section in which this would apply. And the language is, is, um, is shown. However, um, the city solicitor suggested that we um, strike the language that says that OPD staff can determine what size the plan needs to be at recording and that only the planning board have the jurisdiction to say you can record 11 by 17 versus a 24 by 36 size plan. And that would be for in both of those cases um, that basically eliminating any of the language that says <coughs> Office of Planning Development can waive and decide. Okay. Other, and then it's just planning board. So that would have to be your recommendation going forward would be with those changes. There's yeah. also another change um, on the 350.11.2. The city solicitor says not to strike out where it says 2,005 right. square feet of. Yes, thanks. Okay, so, so keep the word square feet in instead of striking it in that middle paragraph under 11.2. Okay, so is everyone clear on what these two are? They're cleaning up language and adding that we will have, uh, these will be filed as well. Yes, yes. Any questions about these? I'm just 
just curious. I know it's been around for a while. from the zoning board to expand along that um, horizontal or vertical plane um, on the side that was not conforming. What the court decision said was, oh, it doesn't matter. You can expand anywhere. You're already non-conforming. You're in the non-conforming bucket. As long as you get approval from the zoning board, you go to town with whatever you want to do, new non-conforming issues, um, whatever you want, as long as the board approves it. So what that means is you could go to three feet, or you could go to the other side of the house where you were never non-conforming before and start expanding on that side. As long as the zoning board makes a finding that it's not substantially more detrimental than the existing condition. So the court said that that, that, that was not a variance. So we've always treated that kind of situation as a variance. And the court says for single and two-family homes only, that wouldn't be considered a variance. It's really just a finding by the zoning board. But this language, instead of using the typical finding permit, um, it's proposed to use a special permit. But, but the special permit criteria is to find that it's no more substantially detrimental to the neighborhood than the previous thing. The reason. So I'm, I'm the person I'm now non conforming, but since I'm non conforming already, it's kind of weird. I can do any weird thing I yeah. want. What you're saying is, like this language, I'm going to have to get a special permit. The court's saying, that's cool. You're fine. You can do any weird thing you want. There's, and, we, and you're saying what we're going to do is, you may be able to do that, but you're going to have to have some kind of... The court said you still need to have the zoning board make the finding. Right. But there are three different permits that the zoning board has. They have a, a finding standard, they have a special permit, and then there's the variant. And this is heightening that standard. Right. This is saying you're still making the board still makes a finding, but it's under a special permit which, which review, is, which requires a unanimous vote of the board instead of a finding. Gotcha. So it's tougher to get. Yes, it's tougher to get, but the language that the board needs to find use in making that determination is what the court says you have to do. And that's what this is. Yes. Okay. Except for one two family. No, this just it's relates to one, just to one family. Right, so if you're a three-family non-conforming, you yep. still abide by whatever we've always we've interpreted. But the courts have decided that based on Massachusetts law, single families and two-family homes are, you know, superior in terms of their value and use. Um, I just, I have a, a point of order here. Maybe you can answer this. If we go over our posted time, do we need to take a vote to continue our meetings? What other meetings do that? I know we're getting more rigid on a lot of things. Okay, good. I'll just we're just can I just say I'm comfortable with this change? I know I'm losing my vote. It might not be too controversial. Okay. Good night, all. Councilor Daniels. Thank you. Uh, I just have a question. When I read special permit, I almost always think of planning board. So this is not special permit by the planning board, special permit by the zone board. 
Right, zoning board section nine in our ordinance is um, basically most of the permitting that relates to zoning board because it deals with grandfathered uses. The zoning board has always been the board that reviews um, projects that are that don't meet the zoning potentially. Um, so this is zoning board of appeals, so you're basically going to them for special consideration. They do do they do review signs. Um, special permits for signs and um, and then detached accessory apartments. Those are the only other. Things and now they, they would do it for this as well. They've always done this section. The only board has always had jurisdiction over this section in the ordinance, um, but mostly they deal with um, finding findings and variances and just a very few number of special permits. This adds another special permit in their review but it's in the context of non-conforming uses, not in the context of signs and other things. Okay. So the state says they can do it. The courts. We're gonna, the courts, rather. And so now we're going to we put this next thing that we have to... A finding was always much simpler than a special permit. Yeah. And, and the reason why it was... Well, a finding was an easier permit to get because it only requires a majority of the board. It's not a super majority. So that's one threshold. The standard for the findings, the language is the same. When the board makes a finding uh, or grants a finding, they're determining that the proposed change is not substantially more detrimental than the existing condition. They will be making that same finding, but it will be a special permit, which means they need three votes, not two, to get there. And that's consistent with the court's rule? The court didn't say which way, what kind of permit to grant. They just said the board needs to make this finding. I'm just kind of curious as to why we want to have a unanimous rather than, than two thirds. I'm just curious why. I think the well, for one, this is basically saying because I think it's more impact, potentially more impact to a neighborhood. Because you're not just saying, I'm a, I have this non-conforming area and everyone in the neighborhood knows that I've been non-conforming for all these years and I'm just going to bump out a little bit. This is saying I can go further, I can go all around my house and add, and that, I think that's very different than a finding. It's like you're making minor modifications, tweaking a house, and then this is saying, do whatever, you can even... You can even encroach into your open space requirements under so this standard. So, in, in just common language, what we're saying here is the planning board and you guys at planning are looking at the court ruling, which seems bizarre to me. You know, saying, this is a kind of, in practice, this is a strange ruling to say, okay, you're non conforming, so therefore we're going to let you be a non conforming about it, almost anything we want to do. We're putting you in that category. You're saying that doesn't work on a practical level, and we want to make sure there's a reason why we have. We grandfather people in. There's a reason why we have these boundaries, and it doesn't make a lot of sense to to keep the standard low. We want to keep the standard high around this, and we don't believe just because you've been non-conforming at one place that we should allow you to do any basically anything you want. Uh, well, I don't think that we allow you to do basically anything you want. But, but, but at the lower standard, yeah. at the lower standard, yeah. Hmm. yeah. I mean, I think it's sort of. Um, I mean, we've always treated this kind of change as a variance because you're creating a new yeah. nonconformity in every other aspect, commercial. Um, so when it was a variance, what were the votes required? A three. So I mean, it's a, a variance is the toughest right. standard to get. But so basically, that's what this would require is three. So what we're right. doing is trying to keep it within the same framework that we had for this kind of thing. Right. So to get a variance, you actually have to show that that piece of property is absolutely worthless for anything except what you're proposing. Right, and the zone, you're, you're asking for a waiver of all the zoning right. because the zoning doesn't work on that unique piece of property. That's not the standard that's being applied in this situation. It's a much lower threshold standard, but the votes needed to get there would be the same. I, I think what's important is as we explain this to other councilors, yeah. the council, that what we're doing is trying to, in practice, do what we've been doing. Yeah. That's what we're trying to do. The court had a ruling. We've had a practice. It seems like our practice has worked fine. We are trying to continue that practice, and the way to do that is to make this change. Now, we could disagree with that. We could say, you know what, we don't like, we think it should have been looser all over the years, slightly looser, and therefore you vote against doing this change. If I have this correct. Yeah, okay. and I guess I would also um, add to that that 
the whole idea of, I mean, we're actually through the zone change that we're trying to create um, fewer nonconformities by making changes to the A, B, and C districts, which, which are the neighborhoods which really have the most nonconforming structures. And so the whole idea is really in the community, I, I mean, this is basically saying your zoning doesn't count. We're gonna, the board has the ability to waive all these other standards about how land is used. And really what we're saying is, you know, if you really want to waive those standards, you should be looking at your zoning and saying, is something wrong with our, is something wrong with our zoning as opposed to making all these, um, you know, case by case approvals. Yeah, but the zoning does count, uh, even, even uh, if you just had to have two thirds of, of a vote of the ZBA, the zoning board, rather, the zoning still counts. I mean, whether it's two thirds of a vote or, or whether it's unanimous. <coughs> well, I, it does, but the board is, itself is very small. I mean, you have three voting members, and it really does make a difference. If you're saying you have to convince three members, for, I mean, it's just three people <laughs> anyway, that this is not substantially more detrimental to a neighborhood when, in fact, you're going from. 30% open space to 10% open space. And so if you're then saying, well, we really only need to convince two, I, you know, I don't, that third person, I don't need to worry about them, I'm just going to focus on two people. I mean, that is a really different standard. I think, and, and I guess what we're saying at a staff level is that if you're really going to be making these potentially within the realm of the regulations, these massive changes to your property, you really should be held to a higher standard I because they could potentially. You know, I think when you come before the whole council, what I would suggest them is, is again, it's not because I just said it, but I finally understood it, which is what we're trying to do is continue a practice we have had, which has worked for us. And we want that practice in place. And the right. court made a ruling, and that has changed yes, that's from, a three from, two, from three votes to two votes. We would like to keep it the way we've had it. And is, if that is correct, if I understand that correctly, because that's it is correct, and although then it is. We can argue whether that practice is yeah. going to continue. I want to just drill down on that a little bit. You, you do have three people right here, so you know that's a comparison to the zoning board. But I, I, what I'm curious about is if you had a single or two-family home. This is what we were talking about. Just just a second here. You had a two, single or two-family home. You wanted to, you were grandfathered because you were not conforming. You wanted to. Make a change that would that was along the non-conforming grandfathered side. You needed to go to the zoning board of appeals and get a variance. Yeah. Uh, if you wanted to just make sort of expand. Yeah. No. No. You don't, no. You, no. No. You wanted to. You were. You were. You, you weren't conforming on your side lot line. Side, okay. and you wanted to go a little closer. Okay. So today, under today's rules. Well, no. Before the Gloucester one. Yeah. Okay. Then you need a variance. Now, took a, a unanimous vote of the zoning board. Yeah. Right, and there were many. There were much more difficult standards by which a variance can be granted. They're very strict. They're very strict. Standards. So now, so the, the Gloucester rule says the Gloucester ruling said you do not need a variance. We only find it. Right. So and what this is doing is going from finding up to special permit which has looser restrictions, but still requires a unanimous vote? Well, partially. This court- Almost got it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it is confusing because of the way we call it, how we call our permits. The court said the board needs to make a finding. And so that's what this language is still saying, that they're making a finding. They didn't say, it's called a special permit or it's called a finding. They said you just need to make the finding that it's not substantially more detrimental. So and so the board regardless of the reality. <laughs> well, but but the board the but what we in Northampton we have when the board makes a finding, we just call it a finding decision. Okay. And so now what we're saying is they're making the finding, but it's under the it's called, it's going to be called a special permit. But the finding standard is the same as what the court said that the board has to make. Right. Can, I, can I continue? Can, yeah. I'm not. See, the only thing that I'm worried about, the only thing I'm 
interested in here is this special permit language because is it is it not possible to say makes a finding a unanimous finding? I mean, it makes a finding that could only be that can only be passed with the unanimous vote. I mean, because that to well, me seems well, except that we have this other section in here that's not written here in the zoning. It says a finding is a majority of the board making the determination yeah. so that the level definition of level can't change right. yet. So, but so then, but then, so then, what are we adding? So, so what is going on here is we really are bringing it back up to similar to variance. But what I want to know is what the difference is between There's what are we huge. adding here with the special permit? Because we're obviously importing requirements regarding special permit that we that we, we didn't have with the variance. Right. So it goes like this um, in terms of scale. Finding easy special permit card or variance, almost impossible. So variance is almost impossible because you're the, you're asking the board to waive the standards in the zoning, and you have to show the statute says very specifically that there's something that there are unique characteristics about the property that you didn't create yourself. There's no other viable options for use of the property unless the board waives that, and that um, you're asking for the minimal change. change that will get you to be able to use your property that you would otherwise. Okay. So those are very... Go, and, and go then, down the, the And then the, the next special level, permit. special permit, is really, um, there's the criteria is in Section 10 about how you're meeting the standard, you know, their, their standards about, um, their technical standards about impacts to the neighborhoods, and then there's the standards about meeting the goals and objectives of the plan. Basically, I mean, there are ten, there are ten standards um, that are generically used for any special permit in the city. But the biggest issue is that it requires a supermajority vote, and that, and and so that means in this case it would be three people instead of two. I have a question. Also, can I? Um, yeah, yeah, but no, I, 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 would you have come forward and asked for any changes to the way we have been dealing with this before the court ruling? Were things working fine five years ago? Was no, there any no, desire no, to change it? No. Okay. In so fact, this would, I think. Okay. This I just, would, yeah. just keep it simple mm -hmm. for me because yeah. I'm getting really confused. Okay. okay. So 10 years ago, five years ago, we liked the way things were working here. We were not looking for any way to change it. The court comes along and makes a ruling which demands we do something to keep our practice which we like in place, correct? The practice we have had, the practice, not the, I don't even care, right now I'm not even going to try to understand. The actual, I'm a homeowner. I've got to go forward 10 years ago and in order to do something, I have a non-conforming property, I'm 10 feet from the line, but what I want to do is come 3 feet from the line. If I came to you 10 years ago, is it going to be easier or harder than it would be now if I passed what you are suggesting, or would in practicality, for practicality. me as a homeowner, be the same? In practicality for you as a homeowner 10 years ago, you would have never Compared to now. Home. No, I'm saying 10 years ago I came, and then I decided I'm not going to do this. I changed my mind, I don't have the money. I'm going to come, and I'm gonna, and, but I was all set to do it yeah. 10 years ago. Then we passed this, the city, we recommended the city code, and this goes in effect. Now I come forward a year from now, would it have, what will have changed for me on a practical level? Will anything be different in terms of the difficult? Will it be more difficult? Yes. Less Ten difficult? Ten years ago, the answer would be no. No what? No, you can't do that. You can't come closer because it requires a variance. But and I could have asked for a variance. But the standard for variance is there's no other viable option for your property. Okay. And since you already have a single family home, you clearly have a viable use of okay, your Okay, so property. 10 years ago it would have been no. No. And now it would be. Now it would be, if you can show us that you're not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood, then we can grant you your permit. Even if we go ahead and approve it. Yeah. So it's become slightly, slightly more possible than it might have been 10 years ago. Right. Okay. And, and I would also say that the other thing about this is, if we don't put it into the ordinance, then we could be subject to be taken to court and have the same ruling that, you know, someone else used the Gloucester ruling to say, city, you messed up, you need to. Well, this one final, the one suggestion, and this may just be me, because I get this language, just starts like that Yogi Berra quote, what is it, 50, 90% of the game is 50% mental. 
I need it. I, I think when you come before council, I think it could be clarified in kind of the language of the for me at least. I think for a couple of the counselors, is what's the practical effect of what the court ruling did in a practical way? If we approve this, what does it do in a practical way? Because to hear that it actually makes it somewhat more feasible for a homeowner to do this than what our old policy was. So okay, so the court ruling has actually changed something to say we need to be a little more liberal in looking at what an individual homeowner wants to do on their property. So if it says I'm supposed to be 15 feet off the line and I'm 10 feet off the line, I am pre-existing non-conforming. I can continue along that lot line, that line with my building, as long as I not the standard as long as you don't become any more non-conforming. That's right. Yeah. That's the current standard today. Okay. Do you need a finding? Yes. For that? Yes. And after this goes through, will you need a special permit? No. You need a special, <laughs> no, for that same no. scenario, no. Okay. Things would stay. It has to be new zoning violations, yes. right? Yeah. New zoning violations. New right. zoning. So you want to go now. About the current zoning. Right. I just want to make sure we're all in the Yeah. I'm good. Okay. Right. Folks, I actually have something I need to get to at 7. Um, so, I, Owen, if you could can I just wrap say up that, for us. But can I just say that I, I like, I understand what's going on here. I just, I'm just wor I just don't know if the special permit is the tool to use. That's why I'm not ready to recommend. My per I'm personally not ready to recommend. Um, I thought that the city was trying to move away from special permitting. Um, and so I'm just... And I, and I almost you don't know, want to do you agree in one. Do you, do you yes. need practice when you need to do something? Yes. So you're saying I'm not sure what it is. That's you right. Need to do. That's right. So I just, and I know, and it may be too much burden to make a new one. So I just, I, I don't know exactly if I'm ready to create a new special permit or permit and process. We can always send this forward. We don't necessarily need to vote to recommend or not recommend. And that question perhaps can be addressed. But further do, down the line, and maybe it'll be just right. your satisfaction. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, I just want to say, I, I do understand that creating a new system might be even worse. I'm just not sure if this, because I know, like I said, I know the studio's trying to reduce special permitting, so I just don't know if special permit is the, is the way to use it. And I always like I, would, I, would, I mean, just special permits in just blanketly were adopted um, as a tool before we had site plan and other review mechanisms. So there are instances where um, you know, if we know we want to encourage certain uses, we don't want to go ahead and put a special permit on it. And I think in this situation, it's not that we assume that this is, you know, necessarily a good thing, but it really is an instance where you want special consideration. Does this make sense? So that's what special permits really should be about. Should we take a step back and think about what's being proposed versus some other uses, which we've already had a policy discussion to say, okay, these uses are good for this area. So let's get this. I always have a problem just requiring a unanimous vote for anything. Um, we don't require that anywhere else. Was there a um, unanimous vote required 15 years ago? For variance? Yeah. No. Yes, and it's only yeah, I'm just trying to point out, we're no, not changing. Okay, what you were saying is, I would, yeah. and that's fine, but what you're saying is, yeah. I would have been against it if we would have changed it years ago because I don't think a unanimous vote should be required. So in practice, we are not changing our policy. Right. You would have been against it 15 years. Yeah, you would have been which against is status quo 15 years That's ago. That's right. Or two years ago. Yeah. Before the court ruling, you would have said, I don't think this is, we should have not require it to be unanimous. And I would just say, I know you have to but the, 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 it's statutorily established for zoning boards that are comprised of three members, a supermajority is three. So it just happens that it's unanimous in Northampton because we have a small zoning right. board. If we had a bigger board, it wouldn't be unanimous, it would be a supermajority. Can we move this question or? <coughs> right, better move the question. Has there been a, has there been a move? A motion? Oh, no, there hasn't been a motion. Motion to move the question. And I need a second. No second on the question. Okay, well, that's, we, can, we can do that. We can, um, we can move. Is that essentially we're moving it forward without a vote? Well, fail, I would this. Well, you're just saying your recommendation. We're just making a recommendation, yeah. which yeah. has a different yeah. standard. It doesn't mean you don't have a recommendation. A vote would mean it doesn't go anywhere, and it still can move to other places. you got to refer it around. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially, yeah. we're powerless. Well, that's the only people biting. <laughs> yeah. 
We can't stop things in God's universe. Well, there is no second, so we're, there's no second. Um, it doesn't necessarily stay here. It, you it's could, maybe, maybe you should move places. it without a recommendation. Can we do that? Would you be willing to second? It? No, wait, that, that's okay. So we do have a second. I move, uh, yeah, I move, I move uh, with no recommendation. We, we, we get out of this committee with no recommendation. So it's a, different, it's, it's a different motion. So you're making a motion, I'll need a second on that motion. That's right. Okay. Can I have a second on that motion? To not recommend. Just to move it without a recommendation. No. <laughs> I think we're going to go anywhere anyway. You can second. I can. Sure, sure you can. Okay. I'm sure. I'll, I'll second. All right. Okay. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? No. Okay. So a two to one vote. You're moving two to one for no, no recommendation. recommendation. Wait, wait. Okay. We're not recommended. Okay. Just move not recommended. Yes. No recommendation. I will agree to move it, but without a recommendation. Without a recommendation. Right. Okay. Thank you. So it's a unanimous vote. A unanimous vote to be to basically not recommend or recommend. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I hope there is no new business. No new business. I, need to I make a move to adjourn. Second. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.